Our second reading today comes from Luke chapter 9, verses 51 through 56. It's a passage I'm sure you're familiar with. As the time approached for him to be taken up to heaven, Jesus resolutely set out for Jerusalem. And he sent messengers ahead who went into Sumerian villages to get things ready for him. But the people there did not welcome him because he was headed for Jerusalem. When the disciples James and John saw this, they asked, Lord, do you want us to call down fire from heaven and destroy them? But Jesus turned and rebuked them, and they went to another village. And I will continue just a couple of verses. Sorry, Bob. As they were walking along the road, a man said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. Jesus replied, foxes have holes, and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. He said to another, come, follow me. But the man replied, I will, Lord, but first, let me go and bury my father. Jesus said, let the dead bury their own dead, but you go and proclaim the kingdom of God. And still another said, I will follow you, Lord, but first, but first, let me go back and say goodbye to my family. Jesus replied, no one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the service of the kingdom of God. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Would you pray with me, please? Oh, gracious Father, we come before you humbly, but we come before you searching, searching for you in our lives and searching to do more, and asking not only that you intervene, but that you guide us. So let the words of my mouth, meditations of our heart, be pleasing to you, Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. Well, friends, it's a privilege, a pure pleasure to be with you here this morning in Milford. As I've gotten to know some of the folks here through our partnership with the AC and through Brian Smith, I've seen and heard so many wonderful things that you do in this community. And of the rich history, we were talking about this this morning, the rich history this church has in this community of both community involvement and family and friend. And Brian also told me you would just love a 45-minute inspirational message. <laughs> <laughs> All right, just, just kidding, kind of. Um, I know your folks are in the process of finding a new permanent pastor. And we, being Presbyterians, know it is a process, right? I believe the session with the guidance of Bryden form a strong partnership to make that happen for this congregation and may God bless you all on that journey. There'll be ups and downs, but it is such a great light you're working for and I know that's gonna happen. This transition you're all gonna go through is a great example of change. Not only the changes that you have and will continue to go through as a congregation, but quite frankly, changes each of you are going to go through on an individual or personal basis, living through and experiencing those changes here at MPC. And whether we realize it or not, changes in organizations, regardless whether they're a commercial organization or a church, they mean very personally, personal change. And while it's an exciting next step for the spiritual growth of this church, and for each of you really, Change does not come without anxiety, even good change. So think about this. How does change impact you personally? Now, are you one of those people that loves change? You just can't wait to mix it up? Bring it on. Let's do it, right? Or maybe you're someone who'd rather just keep the status quo, not make that change. Well, of course, most of us fall into that third group, that category where we publicly say that we're not opposed to change, but inside we have a passing thought at least that says, I'm not opposed to change as long as it doesn't affect me. <laughs> you see, unlike many businesses and organizations that claim they're searching for leadership or searching for that change agent, most of us are really conditionally change agents. 
We may verbally express our support of change, but soon our actions or our lack of enthusiasm most give us away. Change, of course, is dependent on the issue. Most of us are all for change, like new clothes, a new restaurant. We may even go as far as to say we're daring because I'm going to change my hairstyle or my hair color. But now, if you ask me to change where I'm sitting in church, or change that starting time of my church service that I've been going to for 20 years, now you're impacting my status quo, and we're not quite as amenable to that. So what about change brought upon us by uncontrollable circumstances? The unforeseen, the unplanned, or the unexpected. Changes that come from decisions made by somebody else without our input. And of course, we all face those change events in life. Those events we've had no control over, like job layoffs, an accident, that call from the doctor after a series of tests. We've all been there, right? We've faced those. The question becomes, how do we respond to those type of changes? Often our tolerance for change gets more complicated in those personal situations, and our response becomes much more emotional. Conditional change, the willingness to accept the change most of the time, but only under our conditions. Conditions that must fall within our own range of acceptability. And often, if we're honest, often our condition is, don't ask me to do something. Don't ask me to get involved. Don't ask me to change my status quo. You see, as a society or community, that is all around us. Think about this. Of course we have and need a place for the homeless to sleep. It's not in our basement. We definitely need more adult foster care homes. Just don't put them in my neighborhood. We need more restaurants or shopping options in our area. Kristen, just not on my way to work, right? It's Kristen shared with the kids this morning. And those lists go on and on, right? Conditional change under my conditions. You know, we even have a prayer to help us guide through change. It's that serenity prayer, which I'm sure you're all familiar with. You know how it goes, right? God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. Now, some of you may be aware there's actually much more to that prayer, and that's how we'll wrap up this message this morning. But that prayer, authored by American theologian Reinhold Niebuhr in 1930, was part of a sermon he was preparing in Massachusetts. It was first actually published in 1951, and as his popularity grew, it became adopted by Alcoholics Anonymous and several other multi-step programs. And most recently, that prayer has had a gain or a resurgence when Father Jonathan Morris wrote a wonderful study guide book called The Way of Serenity. That, that prayer has such a nice flow. Those verses come to us naturally as we ask God to help us navigate through change in our lives. But I'll be honest with you, even with the prayer, I have to admit, there are times when I just want to say, God grant them the serenity to tell them I'm not changing. Grant them courage to do it their own way, and grant them the wisdom to know that I'm right, they're wrong, and that's all there is to it. Okay, that's a little harsh. Sorry, Brian, apologize. <clears throat> but I think we've all been there if we're really honest with ourselves. We've been there at least a little bit. This morning, we're going to spend some time on intentional change. It's the second line of that prayer, if you will, the courage to change the things you can. You see, in his prayer, Reverend Niebuhr suggests that we too, not just God, but we too need to do something when addressing change. And we need to do it with intent. We need to take some action. Now, lines one and three are very clear that we're asking God to help us out, something we're familiar with. We do it all the time in prayer. But God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change and the wisdom to know the difference is asking God to do something. But that middle line, friends, the courage to take action and intentionally change something in our lives, now that's a different story. 
How often do we actually take initiative, take some action? How often do we intentionally initiate a change when we're faced with some challenge? When we're faced with maybe a change that we know in our heart we need to do to serve God, to be more like Jesus, a change that we need to make, how often do we make that intentional change or do we sit back and wait for God to intervene? How often do we have the courage to make an intentional change and make no mistake, to make a life-transforming intentional change does take courage. And I'm talking about intentional changes like taking the first step to recovery, seeking help for a bad relationship, seeking treatment for depression, or having that tough, honest conversation with a friend who's lost their way. These type of intentional changes all take courage. And each one of those examples of intentional change require us to take an intentional action to make the first step, often not knowing what that outcome is going to be, or maybe even more paralyzing, anticipating exactly what that outcome is going to be, speculating what we may encounter when we have the courage to take an intentional change. But friends, God is with us during these decisions to move ahead. He's not only with us, he is demanding us to take action, even when we seem to be paralyzed by what lies ahead. Think of the scripture that Rick read this morning. I just love this interaction between Moses and God as the Israelites are fleeing Pharaoh and his elite army of chariots. Remember, these were soldiers that were handpicked by Pharaoh to pursue the Hebrews. God led them not on the shortest direct route, which would have taken them directly into conflict with the Philistines. You see, God was concerned that the battle they would face by facing the Philistines would so disturb them that they would just turn around and go right back into slavery into Egypt. So God instead directed Moses to take a path that placed them right between the mountains and the sea. I mean, think about all the dynamics that are going on here, because we often just, we, we visualize the Ten Commandments, and they part the sea, and then it comes back together, right? But think about actually the dynamics going on here. Many of the Israelites we're not convinced to leave Egypt in the first place. And now they look back and they see this incredible army chasing them, just days into their journey. Now they've forgotten all that God has done for them in the last few months, the numerous times he's provided for them. And they are terrified and they cry out in fear to Moses, actually to God. What have you done to bring us out of Egypt? Was it because there were no graves in Egypt you brought us out to the desert to die? Didn't we tell you? We told you, remember? We told you. Leave us alone and let us serve the Egyptians. It would have been better to serve the Egyptians than to die here in the desert. And then Moses has that great motivating response, right? He says, wait, stand firm, be still, and watch the deliverance that the Lord is going to bring to you again. He'll bring it today. But friends, intentional change requires action, not just on God's part. And for Moses, it's no different. I mean, you can just see Moses delivering this very positive message, right? He's very confident. He says, have faith, fear not, be strong. God will deliver. And God does step in. But he doesn't step in in the way Moses was hoping he was going to step in. As we heard this morning, he says, Moses, why do you cry out to me? You need to take some action here. You need to tell the Israelites they need to take action and to move on. You, Moses, need to raise your staff and part these waters. God's saying, look, I'm here with you. Have faith in me. But for crying out loud, man, do something. Get going. Having faith in God is not a spectator sport. You, Moses, you, Israel nation, you have to take action. And of course, we, knows what ha we know what happens next. Although we added those last two verses because Moses still sat back after he parted the sea and waited for God to tell him, bring it back together, or this mission's not complete. Now, I know we all have favorite scriptures in the Bible, and for whatever reason, they tend to be in our heart, and they're with us always, and we love it when we hear that's going to be read that Sunday. They stay with us from the time we hear them. Some might bring a smile to your face or a comfort to your heart, some might even bring a tear to your eye. 
This story in Exodus is one of those passages for me because it says to me, it speaks directly to me, that the Lord is with me, but Mark, doggone it, you've got to do something. You have responsibility too as a Christian. This is not a spectator sport. You must be courageous and be intentional in driving change and taking actions to serve our Lord. You know, another one of those impactful messages to me is the scripture I read from the New Testament from Luke. As the time approached for him to be taken up to heaven, Jesus resolutely set his face to go toward Jerusalem. Though I'd heard this scripture many times in my life, and likely many of us heard it just in the past few weeks as a Lenten service, it was at a special area-wide Lenten service in Granville, Michigan in 1989 that this scripture came to life for me with such an impact, such an impact that to this day I can still remember it clearly. And it remains and moves my heart every time I hear it or read it or think of it. The speaker was the Methodist Bishop Judith Craig. And as clear as can be, I can still hear her reading that scripture from the King James Version. It's a version which states with emphatic bold clarity, that Jesus knew his time to be received up was near. And being a student of the scripture, Jesus knew what was to come. Although, friends, I'm not sure he knew exactly all of the human pain and suffering he was about to endure, he surely knew that his reason for being here is foretold by the prophets to walk among us, to relieve our burdens, our suffering, and to take away the sins of this world, and then to be received up, he certainly knew that. And in that clear, strong voice, I can hear Bishop Craig delivering the King James Version. Now it came to pass when the time had come for him to be received up, he steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem. What an impact. Wow. He set his face to go to Jerusalem. Friends, at that point in his ministry, this was a clear and intentional change. His past three years plus have been focused on great sermons and teaching and healing and bringing God to everyone. His following had increased. He was building that organization, if you will. He was building the organization that was going to carry on after he was gone. There was excitement and there were wonder as crowds gathered together. They'd come for miles to hear the one spoken of. They come to listen to Jesus' teaching of God's love, maybe to witness a miracle, and maybe to have their own lives changed. But his role in carrying God's message, friends, was about to change. And it was a very intentional change on Jesus' part. He knew it was time. And everything, every story, every message from now on, you see, was driven by him setting his face to go face Jerusalem. The disciples became aware of that too. Remember, they wanted to stay on the Mount of Olives. They, Peter in particular, asked Jesus after the transfiguration, right? Why not build shelters for Elijah and for Moses and for you and we'll stay right here? Why not stay in what at that time was probably this beautiful, peaceful surrounding? Why should we go to Jerusalem, a city that was, and actually continues to this day, to be a troubled, unstable area? a constant power struggle of governments and religious leadership. But Jesus was on a mission. And even his heart and his emotions that may have said to him, stay, he knew he had to go and face everything that Jerusalem st excuse me, stood for. It was an intentional action. He had to go face his Jerusalem. You sense the change? In the time most Jews would travel days out of their way to avoid Samaria, Jesus led his disciples in the direct route right through Samaria. It was the shortest route. His intent was very clear. When the disciples asked Jesus if they should punish a village that turned them away, Jesus had no time for that now. You see, he was no longer there to convert or destroy. He was on a mission to face, his, to face Jerusalem, and they moved on. Along the way, he continued to invite some to join him. But they wanted to join conditionally. Remember, one person said, I'll follow you, Lord, but, 
but let me go first and bury my father. And another said, Lord, I will follow you, but let me go say goodbye to my family. Conditional change. I'll go, but... But how often do we say, but... I want to help, but I'd volunteer, but I'd follow Jesus, but, but I want to do it under my condition. They went on at this time because the time was drawing near and Jesus took the action. He intentionally set his face to go to Jerusalem. Think about this, friends. What intentional change do you want to make? Do you need to make? What courageous action have you been putting off? Maybe it's not extreme. Maybe it's just a little change in your life. Making a decision to volunteer at a local charity or for a domestic violence shelter that serves this community. What about going on a youth mission trip, teaching Sunday school a few times a year? What about stepping up to ask a friend or maybe someone you don't know, how can I help you? How can I pray for you? Friends, what Jerusalem do you face? We all have a Jerusalem waiting for us. Maybe it's more personal. Maybe it's knowing someone who is struggling loneliness and addiction or a relationship. Maybe it's you facing those things. You know, your next intentional change may not be life-saving, but friends, I guarantee you, it's going to be life-changing, beginning with your own. In that same sermon that night, Bishop Craig offered a story of a picture that hung in a church where she attended growing up. It's a fairly common print. Some of you may have seen it. It's a portrays Jesus out in this garden, and he's knocking on a cottage, a beautiful garden that surrounds him. But see, there's no handle on that door. Often the interpretation was that Jesus waits patiently for us to open the door so he can come into our lives. The thought being, Jesus will not charge into our lives to take over, but he'll patiently wait to be invited in, patiently honoring the free will God's given us, the free will to make an intentional change to let him into our life. But that night, Bishop Craig shared with me a different interpretation, one that very well could be you and I. Friends, what if Jesus isn't waiting patiently? What if we're on the inside, afraid to open that door? What if we're afraid that if we open that door, before we can invite Jesus into our lives, Jesus will call to us, demanding intentional change, calling to us to take action? What if we're afraid? That as soon as we open that door, Jesus calls, come out, come out, Mark, and go with me to face your Jerusalem. Now we need to pray.